I want to even, I mean, this is just winging. They're always just winging it anyway. We don't know what it is or no. what it's to be, you know, really. So, just off the cuff. Well, uh, can, you, can you tell us all here, uh, when you sort of had a, a change of consciousness and you, you had an awakening, can you, can you tell us about that time? Yeah, yeah. It was before it, it was real confusing because it's like all of my life was building up and building up from when I was my childhood, it was stacking up, you know, and it just kept getting packed and more full and more full and packed and stacked, and you know, but it was just everything, you know, and it wasn't a memory from yesterday, it was a constant all of it at once, you know, and as I grew older, it wasn't just this or that, you know, didn't live my, I haven't lived my life in little, little cubicles, you know, along the way. It's one massive visit, <laughs> you know, there's one massive visitation that I'm in the middle of. And so I can't get away from my past. You know, and some some of it I found real hard to embrace, you know, especially when uh, I became a professional musician, you know, and then suddenly, you know, famous and all of that. You know, that whole thing was a, a pretty much a pothole uh, in, in the road uh, of my life. And so I couldn't really wrap how I was raised and my uh, sense of rightness and wrong, uh, and how it was relevant when I uh, became 21, 2, and 3, you know, at that, that junction in my life. Uh, for me personally, you know, I had become, I was getting more and more stifled. And... You know, I, 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 George, with all his spirituality and Hare Krishna and Krishna Rama and all that, that was really good. But see, now I was raised a Southern Baptist minister's kid. And uh, so our, our look on, uh, was a little bit different. But I, didn't, I wasn't buying that anyway. What I did like was all those beautiful paintings in the Bible. You know, I would sit there and listen to my dad preaching away. He was a great orator. But all the beautiful paintings and that made more sense to me than all that what I was hearing coming to me, you know, because I knew that he didn't believe it. He didn't even know what he was saying, you know. Or with all the seminar and the seminary that he had, he didn't know what the hell he was saying up there. He wished he did, you know, and I think that's the way it is with most people like that. You know, I know their hearts are right and they believe it's right, but uh they don't see any wrongness about it, you know. It's so one way, one sided. At least the Harry Christians, they had ten or fifteen gods, you know. <laughs> the Southern Baptist got one, and you're supposed to be afraid of that guy, you know. And uh, but I, I I saw this thing. I suddenly start things are starting to, in a universal way uh, for me. Being associated with probably George Harrison was the one that kind of like started kicks, subliminal kickstart, you know, and... But you always knew there was something different. I did, you? I did, and more to this than we see, hear, taste, touch, and smell. Right. I knew there was something... Uh, I mean, when you were a child, they were, they were saying that you had like mental problems or something. Yeah, but that was because I <laughs> had a, another understanding of, of who I was then and who I am, you know. It's like I've always been plugged in since I was little. But into what, I didn't know. In, into myself, I guess, you know. Because I've been 
I've said it before, my best friend, I, all of my life, you know, uh, all of my life. I remember vividly sitting in the yard writing Dreams of a Hobo, you know, when I was like 14, 15 years old. I was, it's just as clear I can see it and smell the flowers. And, I mean, you I, were you were born you know, into right? a situation where people did not understand you. Absolutely. Okay. And because you, you've mentioned it to me, at some point you stopped saying things to them because you feared what they might do to you. Yeah, I feared the repercussions of uh, what I might ha have to say because they thought I was a little bit nuts anyway, you know. I mean, my, my parents did put me in a mental institution one time, and it was all that my mom could do. She had to go to the governor of Tennessee to get me out. And why my did My dad they... had, had, had that happen, and there wasn't anything wrong with me, but why, I, you know, I kept why telling did, them that. Why did, you, why did they want to put you in a mental institution? Because I wasn't like everybody else. I wasn't normal like you... them, you know? And... Uh, I, I was just, you know, roused, roused about 14, turned 15 years old, and, you know, uh, just kind of blossoming, and they thought my behavior was crazy, and had always thought my behavior a little bit off anyway, uh, but uh, they behave. arranged for that to happen. I, my mother took me down to J uh, uh, Gaylor um, Mental Institution in, down on, 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 in Memphis, and... Uh, dropped me off and she thought I was going to a doctor. She didn't know where she was taking me down in that basement. She didn't know that that was what, I mean, these guys came to the thing and the, and the window had wire mesh on it, you know, with two doors and these orderlies came and they got me one on each side and took me in there and they closed that door and I looked back at my mother and she had a, a look of horror on her face. She knew where she had brought me in. And there were people laying up under the benches, you know, sucking their thumb, and, and another one playing with a little rubber duck. I mean, these are grown people, too. And I said, there's nothing wrong with me. There's nothing wrong. I, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not crazy. And I said, yeah, you all say that, you know. And it was like three days later, and my mother had to go to the governor and explain what had happened to me. And... It was the damage had been done, you know. I gotta say, Don't and so you... that was just part of some of the clouded issues in my life, and I carried all that with me the whole time. Well, of course, let me just break in for one moment. Don't you think that it was your dad's abusive nature to have had that done to you? Yeah, well, he didn't understand. He had. I, I, I don't. I don't. Uh, uh, it's the way things were. No one was at fault. No one could blame anybody for anything. You know, it was a mess. You know, the whole my upbringing was a total mess, especially when I started to mature, you know. But what that did do, uh, when I was set free, my mother set me free. She stood by me through all of my musical changes and actually took me downtown and dropped me off. Ham, sam, ham and cheese sandwich with a pickle and a $50 bill kissed me goodbye. And now I'm here talking about it. You she know. wanted you to get out of that abusive situation. She wanted me out of the abusive situation. Uh, I grew up in, in, uh, in fear uh, with my, my dad, what wasn't right. He, funnily enough, he was a pharmaceutical junkie before I was even conceived. My mother told me this, you know, about three years before she passed away, and that was only a few years ago. And uh, she, she said, oh, son, didn't you know your dad was a, a, a junkie? I went, what? She said, yeah, he was a pharmaceutical junkie. And I went, I knew he took a lot of pills, but I didn't put, put it behind, you know, his behavior. I thought it was because, you know, the doctor gave him to him, he had to take him, you know. And I just thought he was naturally that way. I never knew him any other way, you know. Uh, uh, but crazy, and you never knew what, what was coming next with him, you see. But so, that was just another clouded er area in my life. And then when I got to England to do all of my, what I was doing, I was like an observer and taking all this incredible stuff in. You know, I was fulfilling my role, playing my part, but I was an observer taking all this in, still carrying all this other stuff with me along you know, along the way, from when I was a little bitty, every day and every night, I, I, 
And here I was with all these fancy people, with all the money and everything, and all big superstars, you know, and I wasn't that long out of the cotton field. You know, <laughs> it was like, I was all eyes, and it was an amazing situation for me. You know, but then I had an opportunity to, uh, I had to, would have compromised my personal integrity to have stayed and been in, in, in that thing. And I chose not to. You know, I chose not to. I chose to walk away from the situation because that inner voice was, that has led me all along was, told me, uh uh, don't do that. You know, that ain't it. This isn't a part of your journey, you know, your mission. And so I listened and I walked and I, I left there, I left everything. That inner voice you're talking about is the same one that got you into trouble when you were a child, is that right? Yeah. Right. So yeah. See, they thought, more people are aware of that sort of thing now than they were then, for sure. Yeah. Well, see, they thought I was bona fide. You're, you know. Yeah, you're talking about your intuition. What's yeah. <laughs> well, it's things kept piling up in my life, and I, I'll get to that this very point of this conversation. But it took all of that building up and building up, and then into drugs myself, into pharmaceuticals. Of course. Turn around, and I was following in my father's footsteps. You know, I was a pharmaceutical junkie. This is what got me and my mother talking about it. On top of that, I'm drinking all the time, every day and night. I was on that farm in Mississippi. I knew I had, something had to change, you know. Out there in the middle of uh, the Nash, Holly Springs National Forest, you know, drunk on my front porch, you know, with a gun in my hand. You know, it's just like uh, something has got to go. This is not part of my role, you know. It's time for me to go, you know. It's time, it's, but it's time for change for me. And I remember the sky was just full of stars. And I went out there and it's just like I had an epiphany. So, suddenly I, I realized that this isn't, this body is not who I am. You know, all of the experience that I've had since I was young constitutes my knowledge and what I've learned, you know, along my, my life's journey, but it suddenly hit me that I'm not this body. I'm not, you know, this body is mine, you know, I inhabit this body, but this body, and it just all started coming together for me. It all started falling in line and meditation and all, everything that, that was, you know, I uh, went to see Dr. Charles Montague in London uh, about uh, smoking cigarettes. Same guy that got Eric uh, straightened out. And he's actually was uh, only a few doors down from uh, uh, 33 Thurlow Street. He was number 12. Mm -hmm. I remember we went by to see him when mm -hmm. we was there. And he's still there. And uh, I, I, went to, I went to thank him. Uh, but... Uh, I, I, I saw him one time. We had a session. It lasted 45 minutes. Just wanted to talk about smoking cigarettes. Well, I had the tape of, uh, that we had, and it was like me sitting and having this conversation with you. Uh, it was over in 45 minutes. But I remembered everything. That, so it wasn't a matter of hypnosis. It was a matter of opening up my ability to take in some information and make it way, way right, way positive. And it included going within, meditation. And I would sit on my porch in Mississippi, in my place, and I said, if y'all see me out here, don't bother me. If I'm sitting here with my eyes, go, please leave me alone. Well, I, most, most of my time in Mississippi, I spent by myself on my farm. But, uh, uh, I, I got deeper and deeper and deeper and deeper. Uh, I wanted to go <laughs> further and like certainly never return, you know. That's how it all started happening with me. And I just had an awakening as to who I am, what, where and why I am, you know. Why I'm here, 